Hey, fifth graders, Rudy and I are back for another chapter of Guest by Mary Downing Hahn. We are on chapter six. I woke to a gray mist that hid everything more than a few feet beyond the end of my nose. The fire had gone out and my clothes were wet and cold, and so was I. All around me, water dripped and dropped from trees. Plink, plunk, plink. The smell of mold and damp earth and moss hung in the air. Guest huddled by the fire's ashes as cold and wet not as I was, snuffling in his sleep like a sick calf. My dog, I called. My dog, where are you? My voice rang in the mist, but my dog didn't answer. Guest sat up, sat up and looked at me. My dog gone. Gone? Gone where? Gone, he said. My dog, gone. Maybe he's just hunting rabbits for breakfast? No, my dog gone. Gone, gone, gone. Guest's voice rose to a shriek. I seized his narrow shoulders and peered into his yellow eyes, searching for a different answer. What will we do without my dog to help us? How will we eat? How will we know which way to go? My dog pointed to my sack. Food. I sighed in frustration but kept my temper. We ate everything last night. Food! Guest pushed himself up on his spindly bow legs and toddled toward the sack. He tried to lift it, but it was too heavy. I ran to help him. Bread, cheese, jugs of milk and water, apples, walnuts, and dried meat tumbled out of the sack. Did my dog leave this for us? For me, he paused and gave me a squint-eyed grin. And you. I doled out portions for us and tied the rest up in the sack. We have to make this last, I told Guest. If we gobble it all up now, we'll be very hungry when it's gone. Guest patted his belly. Hungry now. Why, what did I just tell you? We have to make it last. My dog bring more, Guest said. Did he tell you that? He shrugged. No. Yes. I fought an urge to shake an answer out of him. Which is it? Yes or no? Guest shrugged again. Maybe. Is that what you mean? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I tried another question. Did my dog tell you which way we should go to find your people? Guest pointed down the path. With a sigh, I prepared to hoist Guest onto my back, but he pulled away from me. I walk. I knew he'd not walk far, not on those bandy little legs, but the more he walked, the less I had to carry him. Without Guest on my back, I put my sack into the sling and we set off into the fog. Warm, moist air clung to me. Clouds of midges circled our heads, and whenever we stopped to rest, the midges doubled and tripled in number and forced us to keep moving. Guest began to slow down and lag behind, and when he tottered and almost fell, I hoisted him in the sling along with the sack of food. With his weight on my back and his smell in my nose, I breathed the changeling in with every step I took. For fear of stumbling, I didn't dare raise my eyes above, above the ground under my feet. Sometime after noon, I found myself high above a mist-filled valley. Willing my legs not to tremble, I steadied myself against a rock wall and tried to breathe normally. Just ahead, a waterfall poured in separate streams over a tall, dark rock face. He doesn't know where he wants to go. It seemed to fall from the sky itself and crash to the earth far below. The noise of the water woke Guest, and he moved about in the sling. Be still, I cried. You'll make me trip, and we'll go over the edge. Not trip, no. For once, Guest did what I asked, and stayed as still as our sack of food. Slowly, I made my way downhill. I did not look at the edge of the cliff. I did not look at the waterfall. I looked at nothing but my feet and the rocks and roots on the path. At the bottom of the hill, I loosened the sling and Guest slid to the ground. The fog turned to a cold, hard rain. Guest began to whimper, cold, wet, hungry. 
three. Off to the left was a large dark lake. At one end, the waterfall turned its surface to foam, and to the right, rocks thrust up through tall grass like giant fingers reaching for the sky. We'll shelter here, I said. As I spoke, thunder boomed and lightning dove from the clouds, splitting into dozens of forks. At the same moment, the wind rose and drove icy needles of rain into our faces. With guests behind me, I plunged into the tall grass and made my way toward three tall rocks huddled together like old men. Squeezing through a narrow opening between two of them, we tumbled into a small sheltered place. Grass had grown on top of the rocks, forming a roof of sorts, and the earth was mossy and dry. In the dim light, I saw piles of leaves and dry branches that must have blown in long ago. Gathering some of them, I took out the flint my dog had left in the sack of food. I had some experience lighting a fire, but it took a long time to coax the flames big enough to warm us. I laid our blanket out to dry and took food from the sack. Carrots, apples, cheese, and dried meat made a decent meal for the two of us. By the time we'd eaten, our clothes were almost dry. Guest dozed where he sat, his head nodding on his spindly neck like a flower too heavy for its stalk. He was a sad sight, but I had no pity for him. It was his fault we were here, cold and miserable. His fault I was lying on hard ground with rain dripping in my face. His fault Thomas was gone. With my mind full of wicked thoughts, I glared at Guest's back. There he lay, the cause of everything wrong in my life. Sleeping peacefully while I lay awake, I could barely wait to be rid of him. Pulling my blanket over me, I listened to the rain pound the rocks. Wind howled in every crack and did its best to blow out the fire. Thunder crashed and banged and boomed. Beneath the racket of the storm, I became aware of a faint sound. I sat up and listened closely. Somewhere, a horse whinnied. As it came closer, I heard its hooves strike the earth. Guest stirred in his sleep and sat up, half awake, but clearly frightened. What that noise? A horse, I told him. What's it doing here in the middle of the night? Guest turned his head from side to side, listening hard. He sniffed and tensed like a hunting dog who's caught the scent of something. Not horse. Of course it's a horse. Hear it whinny? Hear, it ho hear its hooves? Guest dove under his blanket. Hide, hide, something wrong. What do you mean? He was beginning to scare me. Hide, Molly, a bad thing out there. Now I was scared too, but just as I pulled my blanket over my head, I heard my dog calling my name. I tossed off the blanket and jumped up. It's my dog, he's back. In a muffled voice, Guest said, No, not my dog. It is my dog, you must be even stupider than I thought. My dog called again. Come to me, Molly. Guest reached out from under the blanket and grabbed my skirt. Not my dog. Stay here. Let me go, you moon calf. I pulled away and ran to the opening in the rocks. My dog's voice sang in my ears. Molly, Molly, Molly. Come to me, Molly. The words twisted around me like a spell and drew me outside. And there was my dog sitting high on the back of the biggest and most beautiful black horse I'd ever seen. His head seemed to touch the sky and his mane hid the hills. Leaving Guest wailing, I ran to my dog as lightly as if I were flying. The horse bowed down to me. His breath was warm and sweet with the fragrance of fresh cut grass. Climb up, my dog said. Climb up and travel with me to my kingdom across the silver sea. I sat on the horse's broad back and he rose to his feet and began to gallop away from the stories where the stones where I'd left guest. I turned to smile at my dog, but he wasn't sitting behind me as I thought. My dog, I cried, where are you? The only answer was a faint cry from guest. Whoa, I shouted to the horse, where is my dog? But the horse paid me no heed. He galloped with such speed the world blurred and I couldn't see the rocks or the lake. Put me down, I screamed, stop. The horse ran faster and faster yet. It was as if we'd left the ground and were riding up into the sky. The horse ripped the rain apart like a curtain and climbed cloud mountains. 
leaping streams of stars. He flew higher and higher until I thought we'd land on the moon. Terrified of falling, I clung to his mane. Where are you taking me? His whinny sounded like a laugh. You chose to answer my call, Molly. You chose to ride with me. You are mine now. What sort of a horse talks? What are you truly? You should know what I am. Take me back to earth, I cried. Please, I beg you. I'm afraid. Onward we went. In and out of clouds, our path lit with lightning, my ears deaf from thunder. I held his mane so tightly my fingers ached. Please, I sobbed. Please take me back. Are you certain you wish me to take you back? Yes, yes. You will have your wish, Molly. Down from the stars he flew. Beneath me I saw the lake's black water, its surface laced with silver ripples. At first sight the lake was no bigger than a rain puddle, but as we plunged toward it it grew larger. I understood that the horse meant to dive into the lake and drown me. I lunged to one side, but the black threads of his mane wrapped themselves around me and held me fast. Into the water we plunged, going so deep I thought I'd never see the sky again. As I struggled to escape, I felt the locket press against my skin. I didn't know if such a small thing would work against a mighty stallion, but I felt dizzy, lightheaded, as if I were half dead already. Pulling it from my dress, I used all my strength to push, push the silver heart against the horse's neck. With a shudder, the stallion threw me from his back. Freeing myself from his mane, I struggled to escape his thrashing hooves. The water was dark and murky. Reeds and grasses wrapped themselves around my legs. I wasn't sure what direction I was going, up to the surface or down to the bottom. With the last of my strength, I burst out of the water. Rain struck my face, and I coughed and choked. The lake rose and fell in waves, but I saw the shore only a few feet away. All I knew about swimming was to kick my feet and paddle with my hands, but I managed to crawl out of the water. I lay still for a moment, gulping mouthfuls of air. I didn't dare stay where I was for fear the stallion might come after me. I staggered away from the lake, but I didn't get very far before the stallion splashed out of the water behind me. I didn't know which way to go, so I ran straight ahead, faster than I'd ever run before. The stallion whinnied and his hooves pounded the ground. He was gaining on me close enough for me to smell the lake water clinging to him. I saw the rock shelter ahead, but I knew the stallion would catch me long before I reached it. So changing direction, I headed toward a grove of small, twisted trees, thinking to hide in their tangled branches. Behind me, the stallion snorted. He was so close now, I felt his breath on my neck. Just as I neared the grove, my dog stepped out from behind a tree and faced the stallion. Speechless with fear, I hid behind my dog. He was all that stood between me and the horse. Enraged, the stallion reared up on his hind legs and threatened my dog with his hooves. Step aside, he cried. The girl is mine. I cowered behind my dog and stared into the horse's face. Mighty he was and beautiful and fearsome enough to take my breath away. What chance did either my dog or I have against something so powerful? Instead of surrendering, my dog held out his hand, his palm facing the horse. What do you want with this girl, my friend? The horse tossed his head and whinnied. His mane flew about him like a ragged black cloud. And then, though I scarce believe what I saw, the horse changed to a man as beautiful and as wild as the horse. Power seemed to light him from within. My dog... I have had dealings with you. His voice was like the thorn, the storm, thunderous and deep. And I drew closer to my dog, who more afraid of the man, if he was a man, than I'd been of the horse. My dog bent his knee. Yes, we traded horses long ago when I was a green lad. No sooner had you left with two of my best stallions than the mare you gave me turned into a spindle-legged pony, worth nothing. The man laughed. Ha ha, yes. Those horses were a fine bargain, I must say. My dog did not laugh. Let's save our reminiscing for another time. Now I ask, why do you waste your time on this mortal? There are some who do not wish this girl to enter their land. She does not belong there, and she brings contamination with her, the man shrugged. I was asked to stop her. Then why haven't you? Another shrug. I imagined her to be a worthy foe, but now I see she's a child, a puny thing. Let someone of less stature deal with her. She's no risk to me. 
And without another word, the man became a mighty horse once more, and wheeling about, he galloped off. I watched the stallion vanish into the darkness, unsure of what I'd seen. A horse who took me up to the stars, and then down to the bottom of the lake. A horse who changed into a man, and back into a horse. How could such a thing be? In confusion, I turned to my dog and said, How did you know to come? I have my ways, he said. Were you close by? I was far away, tending to business. I had bargains to make and promises to break or keep. Then how? Without answering my question, he said, But look at you, wet and cold and shaking so hard you can barely stand. You need the warmth of a fire. Lifting me onto his back, he began walking toward the rock shelter. Mind you, I cannot come running to rescue foolish girls every time they do something reckless. I'm sorry, my dog, but how could I hide in the rocks when you sat on his back and called to me? He shook his head. Oh, Molly, surely you've heard tales of the pukas who live in dark lakes and take lasses like you? Yes, but I'd never seen one, had I? Nor did I think they existed in the real world. Well, now you know that pukas are real. Maybe not in Lower Hexham, but here in Mirkwood and beyond. He paused a moment as if to give me time to think about what he'd said. I hope you've also learned that the kind folk will do nothing to stop you from entering their dark lands. I pulled the locket from under my dress. I saved myself with this. I'll do the same with the kind folk. Do not count on that locket too much. You took the puka by surprise. That's all. It was I who saved you from being trampled under his hooves. And not a word of thanks have I heard from you. Oh, my dog, I do thank you. I promise I'll never be so foolish again. You must not trust anyone, man, woman, or child. In this land, things are not always what they seem to be. And that, my friends, is the end of chapter six. I will record chapter seven on another day. Hope you guys are doing well. Rudy, can you say bye to your friends? Rudy. There he is. Hey, buddy. Can you say bye to your friends? We miss our friends, don't we? Hmm? Do we miss our friends? Yeah, we do. We hope you guys are all doing well, and we'll be back with another chapter really soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.